Next Chapter Podcasts. This is Michael Goodfriend, executive producer of the Play On Podcast. What Shakespeare is to theater, J.R.R. Tolkien is to fantasy. And I've got a podcast to recommend if you've ever wanted to read The Lord of the Rings or anything in Middle Earth, The Prancing Pony Podcast. Every week, your hosts, Alan and Sean, explore the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, bringing along plenty of pop culture references, nerd humor, and a few bad puns. They cover a few pages each week, taking a deep dive into your favorite stories. And while longtime readers still learn from the Prancing Pony podcast, they're also very welcoming to newcomers. So, if you're ready to dive into the most beloved world in fantasy literature and become a part of a vibrant, active community of listeners, look for the Prancing Pony podcast wherever you listen. Hi. My name is Michael Goodfriend, and I'm the executive producer of the Play On Podcasts. Tracy Young is an accomplished theater director and playwright who began her writing career developing several original plays with the Actors Gang in Los Angeles, including the musicals Hysteria, which was an Ovation Award and Penn West finalist, Euphoria, which received the Ovation, LA Weekly, and Garland Awards, and A Fairy Tale, which received the Garland and Glad Image Awards. She co-created Medea Macbeth Cinderella with Bill Rausch, a simultaneous telling of Euripides' Medea, Shakespeare's Macbeth, and Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, which she calls her most challenging and joyful work to date. That is, until she took on the play on podcast series, The Winter's Tale. This is part two of my interview with Tracy Young. So we've talked a ton uh, on our bonus content series about uh, Cornerstone because so many yeah. uh, artists have been affiliated with that, in, at least yeah. in, in the, the um, play on podcasts. But we haven't talked a lot about the Actors Gang. What did the, can you tell us what the Actors Gang is? is or was and and did that come before cornerstone for you or after it came before um so yeah i i grew up in la and there was uh a group of uh theater majors at ucla out of ucla uh in the oof in the 80s omg i think the 80s right uh, who, who were at, uh, who were majoring in theater there, good theater program there. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, uh, a, a, one of the main, um, actors in the Teatro du Soleil, that's a French, well-known French, uh, theater company, uh, came to do a master class, uh, came to do kind of an intensive with, for a couple of weeks with, uh, that class of actors and the Teatro du Soleil, centers their work on Commedia dell'arte uh, style of performance, which is a very presentational uh, style. It's a, uh, it's kind of like street theater. It's got a sort of um, immediacy. It, it was a lot of traveling troops who would travel around town to town and kind of um, set up, set up a rough stage and then improvise uh, scenarios based on stock characters, but kind of a lot of improv, a lot of comedic improv and interaction with the audience, sort of a very not fourth wall kind of a form. And so this, um, so Georges Bigot from the Tete du Soleil came and did this intensive work with this group and they all loved it so much that when they graduated, they decided that they wanted to kind of create a company that would focus and continue that work. And that became the Actors Gang. Um, and specifically, uh, Tim Robbins uh, was one of the, you know, early in his sort of acting career, he would work television and film gigs, and then uh, he would take some of that money and put it into renting a warehouse space in downtown Los Angeles uh, industrial district. And we would all go down there and, um, you know, rifle through big boxes of costumes and things and, uh, and just for its own sake, kind of do this comedia work, do these impro improvised 
uh, workshops for an evening, you know, a couple times a week. And out of that came plays, eventually got developed and presented and so on and so forth. So that that's how that company kind of started. And it was really, it's really been the engine of that company all these many years. And the company still exists. Um, they work out of a space in Culver City uh, in Los Angeles now. And um, so, yes, as you say, many people have kind of traveled through that company over the years. It's been around for a long time. And I was, I was uh, through my friend Cynthia Ettinger, another wonderful actor. Uh, she brought me into, you know, come on down and do some of this workshopping we're doing every week, um, you know, to play. And it sounded really fun and I loved it. And I, it just the, the form really spoke to me. And so that's how I got involved in that. And that grew into once uh, the company got sort of a permanent space. Um, it was a very straight, white, male driven company. A lot of, you know, a lot of sort of straight dude energy in that company. Very muscular, physical, uh -huh. dude, dude, bro sensibility, which was both, you know, exciting and and really physical and fun when we were you know young and at that age and you know rough on rough on anybody who wasn't that in some ways so mm -hmm. like i i ended up being um one of the first female you know directors to to do stuff um so that's kind of that was good and hard and and that was kind of my that was kind of like my schooling um i didn't i didn't go to college during those years i was uh i was running my you know a catering company <laughs> and <laughs> i probably worked like for that, you. working on music videos during the mtv area uh so i i uh but that was really my learn by doing kind of thing and Do you feel uh, like while you were there you were able to shift the dynamic a little bit just through your work <laughs> as a director yeah. Or did yes it, it did no. it end up yes like no. causing a rift? I, mean, I think that I, among others, you know, it just the 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 thing was its own living, breathing entity, you know, and and the people who would come in and be there for a while would, of course, the dynamic and the and the sort of whole ethos would would evolve br and breathe with the people who were involved. So I was one of those people. The first play that I created with an ensemble of actors was this play called Hysteria that was all about kind of um, uh, the rise of the of the Western male dominated medical profession and the sort of discrediting of midwives that happened in the, uh, you know, in the early uh, 19th century as that was kind of solidifying in the industrial revolution time. Uh, medicine as a profession, you know, that was populated by then men who be doctors mm -hmm. and women who were patients, you know, and let's remove her ovaries because she's hysterical. You know, she's being, you know, whatever, all that sort of hyper misogyny that came about as a result of that. So that was a very, um, I thought, a rich subject for uh, exploration in the commedia form. And it became this kind of musical about <laughs> midwifery and um and we were living in kind of the era of the supermodels in the nineties. So there was a lot of like body, body issue propaganda, you know, in the media with, for women, you know, a lot of like, uh, a lot of body tyranny, right. Around physical mm -hmm. beauty. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so those two, so the play kind of touched on all that. And it was to me a very sort of themes that were both, um, women centered, but also very much in keeping with the kind of high rev, kind of hyper stakes driven um, aspect of the comedia form. Um, anyway, and it was funny with music, whatever. So out of that, you know, yeah, I think that that's the play was successful and, you know, got some notice and it was good. And I think that shifted some of the dynamics of the company. Definitely more more women were directing. Um, much more LGBTQ presence within the company membership came about during that time. Um, uh, and so, you know, it evolved. And then, you know, there was another era where I and a bunch of others sort of departed the company and the company kind of reformed and can, some of the original members are still with the company, but the company also brought in a whole new 
sort of group of other people and it evolved after that. So of course the company is going to really reflect still, you know, the ethos of what it originally started as, and it still does, but it also evolved with the people because that's what company's all about. Right. So, sure. and, and, you know, oh, as, Oh, so it's going through that similar, you know, shift too, right? The, the errors of the different artistic directors that have led that company, I think, have had a profound um, shaping of what that company is and becomes, and what it what its focus artistically is, and the plays it wants to present, and all of that. And you know, so that's a cool thing that you get to see over time with companies that that keep going for that long. I hope you're enjoying this conversation with the creatives behind the scenes. To listen to the full interview, join the Play On supporting cast for just $5 a month, which by the time you hear this might be less than you'll pay for a gallon of gas. You'll get in-depth interviews featuring some of the most brilliant artists working today. You'll also enjoy ad-free episodes of the Play On podcast series. Subscribe today for $5 a month. Join the cast go to ncpodcast.com and sign up today. Thanks for listening. Hello, Aria. Did you want to listen in on me and Rock enjoying ourselves? Don't encourage Should I describe to you what we're doing Um, right now? (laughs) What's going on? Let's see. Look, these wind shells document anything you do in order to banish the spirits. I don't banish spirits. I'm fixing the tango. Of course, we can't open a new hole into the Aetherweb every year. But spirits aren't always... Bad. Are Those they? are exactly the reason Tangleweeds happened in the first Akasar, place. I'm sure Rocka knows how to get through a water gate without disrupting the magic bell. So, what happens when there's a hole in the weave? Does magic <laughs> pour out? It is already broken! Let more of air into this world! Help destroy Wait, no, every single no. one of them! You're fed enough already! I will kill you, you filthy! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Calm down, Rocka! Try it, fellow duster! God, ferocious rune master! Your friction will grind the weave away! <sighs> Yarta. In moments like these, I wish I could see the runes. What's wrong, Raka? Is that tangle weave maybe too difficult even for someone as great as you? Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get podcasts from. Next Chapter Podcasts.